in oral history with Ken Corfield. Um, and we are at the uh, Building 60 of what remains of the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant. And today's date is March 10, 2005. Um, Ken and I will be talking about his work uh, with Rocky Flats uh, as uh, uh, an outsider, so to speak. My name is Dorothy Charlo. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And as I said, the first question is, when and where were you born? Mm -hmm. See, I was born in Canyon City, Colorado on February 23rd of 1958. And can you tell me something about your family and your early life? Mm -hmm. Well, I grew up in uh, Canyon City, which is a small town, and uh, we grew up in the outskirts of Canyon City, kind of out in the country, and I come from a small family. I have one sister uh, in addition to my parents, and uh, it was a, a pretty good experience of being able to, to grow up in a small town compared to living in Denver, where I have for the last, uh, let's see, 24 years, uh, and so it's been interesting to, uh, that I've spent now as much time in Denver as I did in Canyon City, but I still think that's home. Is your family still there? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, what did your father and mother do? Let's see, my father is in uh, is retired from construction, so he worked in a lot of different uh, major construction projects in the southern part of uh, Colorado, in Pueblo, Colorado Springs area. Uh, my mother is a homemaker, and uh, uh, they've been married for 52 years now. And uh, I have uh, one sister then who still also, lives, my sister also lives down in Canyon City. And, uh, uh, her husband, and then she has one daughter, a niece, who is now 24 years old. And how did you, uh, when did you leave Canyon City, mm -hmm. and did you leave for what reasons? See, I graduated from high school in 1976, and then I went to college out in Nebraska in, in Creighton University, which is in Omaha, and I studied, uh, I was a biology major and a pre-medical student, and then uh, I uh, was accepted into medical school at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center here in Denver. That's what brought me to Denver in 1980. And I spent uh, two years in uh, medical school and uh, decided to take a year's leave of absence to decide whether that was really what I wanted to continue with uh, career rise. And during that year off, I decided that I wouldn't go back to medical school. And then I looked for some other uh, alternatives. I was very interested in public health uh, type of issues. And so then I uh, looked at the University of Colorado uh, at Denver and they had the Graduate School of Public Affairs and so then I started taking classes there uh, and was really looking towards more of a public health policy. Uh, took some courses in environmental health policy and really realized that I had a co-interest then with the more traditional public uh, health epidemiological type of uh, studies as well as environmental studies. So. So, and did you finish that program then? Well, I was waiting tables at the time to support myself, and so I was getting uh, kind of low on funds, and I didn't want to take out any more loans because medical school was pretty expensive the two years that I spent, so I was paying for uh, the rest of my graduate studies as I went along. And so then I was looking for a full-time job, and it was in 1990 that then that I saw an ad in the paper for the uh, 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 position with a group called the Rocky Flats Cleanup Commission. And so that's, I applied for the job, and that was one of the, uh, actually my first real job in life uh, was with the Cleanup Commission, and I started with them in October of 1990. Um, unfortunately, most of my uh, uh, coursework at that time at the Graduate School of Public Affairs were uh, evening courses, and so uh, with the number of evening meetings that I had to start going to connect with Rocky Flats and the public involvement there, I was, uh, I stopped taking classes, and then as the years gone by, then I never really did go back to complete my uh, degree, but I was really appreciative of the coursework that I took because it was uh, pretty interesting stuff and has really been applicable to the work that I've done for the last 15 years. So you started uh, with the Rocky Flats Cleanup Commission as the, was that the one paid staff person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were uh, a group that had formed, they had a technical assistant grant or a TAG grant from the U.S. EPA uh, and the EPA uh, provides these grants for each of the uh, Superfund sites across the country where uh, if there are citizens that are concerned about the cleanup of that area and they're not really maybe trusting of the, the official word from the, either the health department or whatever agency is in charge of the cleanup, uh, but then they can uh, use that money 
provided by the grant to hire their own experts to help them interpret the information and then it provides a level of credibility for the, the cleanup at those different Superfund sites. Uh, the Rocky Flats Cleanup Commission was the, they were awarded the TAG grant uh, in 1989 and then they decided that they would like to handle or hire a full-time staff person uh, to help them with their work and so that's, they uh, did the hiring process and then I started in October of 1990. Uh -huh. for them. Can, can you tell me something about how you, you said you saw the ad in the paper, mm -hmm. but what was that process like to, you know, uh, learn more about it and be interviewed mm -hmm. and so forth? Well, it was, uh, again, because this was uh, uh, my first real job and so I was, you know, had applied for other positions uh, throughout the, about for a year uh, before that and so uh, you know I wasn't successful in getting any of those jobs but I really was kind of picky in terms of what I was looking for as well and um, so I was uh, was not really familiar with Rocky Flats other than uh, uh, I remember that there had been a, a citizens initiative uh, in, during the 80s which was to uh, close down and convert Rocky Flats and that was really the first time that I'd ever heard of Rocky Flats even despite being a Colorado native and, and, and spent as many years as I had in the state uh, but I really hadn't heard of Rocky Flats and I was more familiar with the Rocky Mountain Arsenal probably than the, uh, uh, because that was probably in the news more in terms of its cleanup and the nerve gas and the earthquakes and everything that were involved with the Arsenal versus uh, uh, Rocky Flats and so um, I think that was something to my favor then when the members of the cleanup commission hired me because they really didn't want somebody that had some pre uh, conceived notions of what to do or somebody that was uh, you know, already had ideas and so uh, that, at least they told me that was one of the reasons why in, in my hiring process that they found me appealing because of my educational background uh, they thought it was a good combination a good fit for them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Do you know whether they interviewed a lot of other people? I really don't know I can't remember at the I know that there was a, a one other person that was interviewed uh, eventually uh, came to work in the same office that we shared uh, with the Physicians for Social Responsibility and the Colorado Coalition for the Prevention of Nuclear War, uh, as they were called at the time. Uh, and so one of the other persons that had interviewed for the job then uh, was uh, hired by the Physicians for Social Responsibility, so uh, I got to work for him for a period of time. Now, um, do you know, did you know, what well, you probably didn't know then, do you know now kind of the background of the Cleanup Commission uh, you were saying a little bit about it earlier, but mm -hmm. could you kind of go into more detail mm -hmm. from what you know now? Uh, they were, uh, there had been a lot of interest, of course, in Rocky Flats by the activist community all through the 1980s, and it really began in the late 1970s. And so, uh, when the opportunity to, uh, to apply for the, the TAG grant program came along, uh, there was a, a coalition of, of different groups that were uh, had established themselves to look at Rocky Flats, but none of them received any funding. So it was mainly just citizen volunteers that were uh, um, involved. And so there was a uh, as part of the application program for the uh, the TAG grant, the, uh, there had to be a coming together of many different uh, groups within the community. And so I don't know how many of the different groups got together. I think both of them were individuals uh, that were the ones that originally applied for the grant and then uh, were accepted uh, and began working together. But I and think the most monies of them then came from the in EPA, the right. Environmental mm -hmm. It was the EPA's uh, grant program. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. there. So it was, uh, uh, but it was rather interesting because when I first started, I mean, I was their first employee and uh, so they didn't really know what it meant to have an employee and it was my first real job. and in life so it was a rather interesting experience to walk into the, my office for the first day and there wasn't a desk, there wasn't a, a chair, uh, there was just a space that we were going to use with the, or share between the other two groups and, and so I was not knowing what to expect in, in terms of what a real job was going to be like, a, a 9 to 5 type job. That, uh, uh, so it was pretty interesting to, uh, to work with them and to set up an office and to, uh, to really find our way in terms of what my roles would be versus uh, you know, what their expectations were, so that's pretty interesting. So that whole group then was made up of, of um, involved citizens, N no one officially from Rocky Flats, is that correct? That's correct. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
So they were all uh, just activists within the community. Some of them had been involved for a long period of time. Others were fairly new to, uh, to Rocky Flats that they had been able to bring in. Uh -huh. And did, uh, was that considered to be uh, like a board or something of that sort? That's what they uh, they did have a uh, was a board of directors, but all the all the members were were board members in there. And I think that uh, there may have been as maximum of, of twenty at one point, and then uh, but most of the time there was a, a kind of a changeover membership during the four years that I worked for them. But I think we averaged probably anywhere from twelve to fifteen members uh -huh. uh, at any one time. And they would hold monthly meetings, and uh, then they had different committee meetings or, uh, that they would hold during the month. And so it was a fairly active group. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, of their own meetings, and then there was a lot of meetings associated with the, uh, the official meetings for Rocky Flats cleanup uh, that were held. And um, so I spent a lot of time going to meetings and uh -huh. have for the last 15 years. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what what people uh, from that original group do stand out in your mind? Mm -hmm. uh, I think probably the, the person that I admire the most and, and really learned the most was Joe Temple, who was the uh, the chair at the time when I uh, uh, was hired by the Clean Up Commission. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, and I don't know if he still works for the Department of Transportation for the state of Colorado, but was working with environmental uh, programs and doing environmental assessments connected with the highway projects in the state. And so he was used to being on the other side of, of the hearing table where, you know, that his department would have to hold hearings related to projects that the state was doing for highway construction. And so uh, I think that he learned a lot about the uh, effective ways to be a citizen activist or someone coming to express their views on a particular plan related to highway construction. And so he would, when he the tables were turned. He was going to hearings by the Department of Energy and the people at Rocky Flats to uh, to talk about Rocky Flats cleanup uh, proposals. But uh, he was always mindful to be respectful of the people uh, there. Whereas other people were always angry. They were always going, going to meetings and screaming at the people that worked at Rocky Flats, and uh, which I thought was uh, not. I was really shocked by that because I had always grown up to to respect others and and you know my. Kind of conservative upbringing, and we just didn't raise our voice in public, and and uh, so I was a little bit shocked at the way that some people express themselves in those meetings. And uh, but I learned from Joe that you could be very calm, and as long as you had your facts and information, and it was hard to argue with somebody uh, that presented their facts in a very confident and, and uh, concise and clear manner. And I think that he gained a lot of respect then from the people at Rocky Flats and the and the regulators that were involved with the cleanup versus the person that was going to go to the meetings and, and, you know, and stand up and yell and scream and stomp their uh, feet and pound their fists onto the table because I think the people then are turned off by that message and so they don't, uh, are turned off by the messenger, I should say. Yes. And so that way they don't hear the message that's being spoken. And so people may have a very good message to deliver, but if they're, uh, they as messengers of that, uh, whatever they have to say is presented in a manner that you know, turns other people off or frightens them or uh, you know shows any disrespect that then that message is lost mm -hmm. and so that's mm -hmm. something that I learned from Joe and, and others throughout the, the history of my involvement is that the uh, uh, people who were always remember to respect others are probably those that are going to get their message across be understood and, and to be accepted uh, for what they have to say uh -huh. Uh -huh. now this was really your first experience then in uh, shall we say advocacy work mm -hmm. or with activists, is that right? That's right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Did you have any idea before you got involved in this, you know, what it was going to be like in terms of some of the conf conflicts and the different very strong feelings that people have about Rocky mm -hmm. Trump? Well, uh, I have learned then over the, the 15 years that Rocky Flats is a very uh, tough subject to, to deal with in terms of the personalities that, that are involved and the, and the passion that it can bring out in people. Um, and so that has been a, I don't really have any other uh, activist type of experience to, to really look at uh, for that, but I uh, would hope that it uh, is not always as contentious or con uh, with as much contemptuousness as what it is uh, for Rocky Flats as in, in other areas, but I have a suspicion that it probably is. Uh, that when people's passions are involved about something that um, they're going to be out there. And so that's, uh, it's good to have the passion, uh, 
but then again, as I said, uh, with the example of the Cho Temple, that you can uh, temper that passion uh, and put it towards more productive uh, methods of delivery that you know, yeah. you're going to be more successful. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the task then of the, this, uh, the Rocky Flats Cleanup Commission? Mm -hmm. the, the TAG grant was funding it. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what were you uh, doing? What was your uh, mission? In the uh, time period from uh, when the group was formed in 1989 and through the first part of the, the 90s, uh, the public involvement at Rocky Flats was really what was more regulatorily required. As a, as a Superfund site, uh, they were required to have uh, public meetings to talk about documents and then there was opportunities for official public comment and so that comment could be submitted both in written form and then through oral testimony at hearings. And so that was the early experience was uh, was to help prepare for those hearings and to prepare the written testimony then that we would uh, present uh, in an official capacity to the uh, Department of Energy and the regulators on uh, cleanup proposals for the site. Uh, I think the Department of Energy was learning though based on its experiences with the, uh, because uh, it had been a very closed uh, facility for uh, since its beginnings in 1950s. Uh, you know, not having really to deal with the public on a on an open manner, uh, that was really an eye-opening experience for them to realize that with the Superfund law, that that required them to do certain things, and I think they began to see the value though of the public's involvement and the public knowing more about what was happening at the site. So then there was a lot more opportunities beyond what was officially required, uh, uh, and so there were. Uh, we actually got to start looking at documents earlier than what the official comments, so they would be like earlier draft of uh, proposals for uh, uh, cleanup projects. And so I think that they really, uh, the site began to see the value of, of bringing the public in earlier uh, to work on problems. So then when the actual documents would come out in an official manner, uh, most of the problems had already been worked out or uh, you know, a lot of the discussions had already been held. And so people weren't as surprised by the content of the document and didn't feel that it was in the traditional, uh, as they would say, that you decide as an agency, you announce your decision and you defend it. And so that uh, decide, announce, and defend is kind of a, a cliche for how agencies do their business. Uh, but I think that, that was really how Rocky Flats first approached uh, its work at, at, for cleaning up the site. But then they realized that there was more benefit uh, to bringing people in earlier and to holding more meetings and being more open about what was happening. So. I've really been able to witness that transition, uh, and I think it's been a very positive uh, example for how um, you know federal agencies or any agency that's responsible for uh, cleanup of a site like Rocky Flats can really work with their community uh, to involve them in the decision making more than what's required by law. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And can you say a little bit about um, this requirement by law came about because of the Superfund? Mm -hmm. um, designation of Rocky Flats, is that correct? That's right. And how did that, do you know anything about how that came about? Well, I, in terms of the official naming of Rocky Flats as a Superfund site. Had that been done uh -huh. by the time you took on this Right, job? that was, uh, I think the, well the official designation as a Superfund site at Rocky Flats was in 1989. Uh, and so there were studies that had uh, gone on before that uh, and it was really quite ironic that the, the reason why Rocky Flats was placed on the Superfund list, which is the, the sites in the country that require the most immediate attention, mm -hmm. was there was concern about uh, uh, groundwater contamination and then becoming surface water contamination uh, for the downstream users. And so that would be like for uh, the citizens of Westminster at Sandy Lake. And uh, um, this area was called the 881 Hillside, and it was where uh, uh, organic compounds or uh, volatile organic compounds or liquids had been dumped out over the hillside and so there was a, a worry that these materials were going to get into the uh, drinking water supply. So it really wasn't for, I mean Rocky Flats is always associated with nuclear materials, but it wasn't for the nuclear materials that it got placed on the Superfund uh, list. Uh, and this, what's the true irony of this is that then as we've learned more about the contamination at the site, that the, uh, the threat of the uh, material at the 81 hillside turned out to not be as, as uh, dramatic or as imminent as what people had first thought. 
And so uh, it's possible that if they had known that information a few years earlier, that Rocky Flats may have never been placed on the Superfund list. But uh, I think it was really beneficial that it was because that allowed there to be more of a, a formal process for the cleanup. And that really was beneficial for the citizens then to become involved in the cleanup as well. Oh. Now, just a point of clarification, the Superfund uh, was, was not at all involved then with nuclear material, is that's that right. right? Is that still the case? And that's pretty much the case today, and that's something that's been very interesting to learn about the, uh, the cleanup of the, uh, or the whole nuclear establishment in our country, that uh, when the Atomic Energy Act was passed back in, I believe, the 1950s, uh, this was after the Cold War, or after the World War uh, II, in the, in the beginnings of the Cold War, uh, that the country wanted to uh, move forward with the production of nuclear weapons. But then there was also the idea that there would be peaceful uses of, of nuclear uh, energy or for developing power plants. And so the Atomic Energy uh, Commission was formed as a result of the Atomic Energy Act. And so uh, the Atomic Energy Commission would be responsible for the civilian uh, construction or fabrication of the nuclear bombs, which then would be turned over to the uh, Department of Defense. And so that way, uh, they didn't want the defense establishment for having the, the responsibility for producing the weapons, but they still wanted it to keep it within the government's control, and so then they formed the Atomic Energy Commission for that purpose. Uh, eventually then, uh, there was the civilian side of things in terms of the, the peaceful uses of nuclear materials for nuclear power plants, and that was uh, then established to be under the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, and I believe probably the Atomic Energy Commission was all at one at one point, but then eventually the Nuclear uh, Regulatory Commission for the civilian uh, peaceful purposes of the nuclear materials was broken off. Uh, and so that any of the regulation, like for universities that use nuclear materials with their research purposes, hospitals, uh, any of their, uh, on that side of the, the civilian use of materials is regulated by the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But then the Atomic Energy Commission which then became the, the um, Energy Research Development Administration, which eventually became the Department of Energy, uh, has been responsible for the uh, uh, fabrication of the nuclear materials and the development of the, the nuclear weapons. Um, and so um, how that worked for the regulation of Rocky Flats is the state of Colorado, which has responsibility for the, uh, the, the cleanup at the site, uh, for the what's called the hazardous materials, so that would be all the chemicals, the mineral, or the um, you know, not minerals, but the uh, metals that would be involved uh, at Rocky Flats that are hazardous in any manner. The state can regulate those materials, but they can't regulate the nuclear materials because that still falls under the uh, from the old Atomic Energy Act that says the Department of Energy has sole regulatory responsibility for those nuclear materials. And that's just because it's involved with, this was a federal facility producing the nuclear weapons, and so that was uh, the way that the laws worked out. And so that has remained to this day that they, uh, there really is no regulation of the nuclear materials at the site uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency or the, the State Health Department, but it's all done by the, internally by the Department of Energy. Yes. Uh, but because there's also the hazardous materials, and, and it's always interesting to talk to uh, people in the community when you talk about hazardous materials because they say, well, aren't radioactive materials hazardous? And so uh, it's, uh, of course they are, yes. uh, but it's just the definition and the, and the words that you have to learn to use and uh, the hazardous materials or the everything besides the, the radioactive materials. Well, that's very interesting. And I, I suspect that uh, this is something that's still not understood by most people. That's right. that, uh -huh. So uh, then there's, uh, it's interesting then that there are mixed radioactive wastes, which have both the hazardous component as well as the radioactive component. Mm -hmm. And so the state of Colorado is able to uh, use its regulatory authority to, uh, uh, to govern the materials that are mixed because they do contain the, uh, the hazardous component as well as the radioactive component on that. And so then there's, uh, and this really even affects where the nuclear materials can be disposed of uh, because the, the mixed materials, uh, currently are, are being sent to the EnviroCare facility in uh, uh, Utah, which is a private facility which is licensed by the state of Utah that can handle both the, uh, the radioactive and the hazardous component. Uh, this, 
what they call the straight nuclear materials or just radioactive waste that don't have anything else mixed with them are sent to the Nevada test site which is owned by the federal government that's where the uh, nuclear weapons were tested uh, back in the 50s and 60s and there's still a lot of active work uh, connected with nuclear weapons development at the Nevada test site but they have the a large waste disposal facilities which they bring in there but they are not licensed by the state of Nevada to handle any of the mixed materials and so only the straight nuclear waste can go to Nevada and so it's uh, uh, just these nuances in the law really have a large difference in terms of where the nuclear materials are sent and then the, the amount of money that it costs to, uh, to dispose of them. And can you speak to that just a little bit? Mm -hmm. The amount of money increases greatly when right. there's radioactive the, uh, material? Is that the case? Well, it's really the, uh, the private facilities then, uh, like the EnviroCare facility in Utah, then uh, charges for a, a fee for all the materials that are dumped there. And so it's kind of a, a, a seller's market. Uh, there's not a lot of facilities out there that are accepting nuclear materials, and so that uh, they can charge a, a large amount of money. And I, I really don't have a figure in, in terms of what they charge for a, uh, a barrel or a, a cubic yard of waste that goes out there, but it is more expensive than what the Nevada test site, which is a Department of Energy facility, then they don't, uh, there is a certain transfer of funds uh, that goes, uh, or from the federal treasury that goes to the Nevada test site to, to pay for their expenses in, involved in these materials, but the, the cost is, is probably considerably less than what it is for the private facilities in Utah. Well, now, going back to the uh, Rocky Flats Cleanup Commission, mm -hmm. um, the people that you began to work with, in addition to Joe Temple, um, were they, did they designate themselves, or was there some, they were the people that had written the grant, mm -hmm. is that right? And did that group remain the same throughout the whole time that you worked with the Cleanup Commission? There was a, changes, a, a not a large turnover, but there was some turnover in membership. And so then it was the, uh, if someone was interested then in becoming a member of the uh, commission, then they would apply to the group, uh, and then they would uh, uh, look at that person's application and then uh, bring them in. And I don't remember anybody that, that uh, there weren't that many people who applied, and so I don't really remember anybody that applied that wasn't accepted. And so uh, they were really looking to, uh, for mainly people that have interest and then had the time commitment yeah. Uh, for that because you know there was uh, a lot involved in the evenings uh, to attend meetings and, and to do work and reviewing documents and uh, writing comments on those documents and so um, yes um, I as I mentioned before I interviewed um, um, Bill Kemper mm -hmm. uh, recently he was he one of those that were part of the right and he was probably mm -hmm. one of our, our more active members and he had an interesting background because he was uh, in the Navy in the, uh, during World War II, and so he was a, a witness to some of the first of uh, the atomic uh, shots and the, uh, the tolls down in the South Pacific. And so he was uh, very interested in that, and he was uh, uh, affiliated with a group then that was uh, Atomic Veterans and Agent Orange. Uh, so it was veterans from the uh, World War II that were involved and were exposed to the radiation from the test shots both at the, the land shots at the, uh, and then the, the ones at the, out in the Pacific, as well as in the Agent Orange victims from uh, the Vietnam era. And so uh, I don't know of any uh, particular health uh, problems that he had. He never did talk about those, but he was very interested in the, uh, that veterans group. And so I think that was really maybe where he first came to the attention of the people involved with uh, uh, the cleanup commission and mm -hmm. uh, he did bring a lot of experience in because he worked then in some of the first power plants uh, in the United States and then he was a, uh, uh, a professor of physics at Metro State College uh, for the last part of his career before his retirement and so he had a really good background and was kind of there as all the, the nuclear uh, work was being done in its early stages and so I knew a lot about uh, whenever we had to you know, ask a technical question or needed a technical answer, uh, Bill was always somebody that we could go to because you know, he could talk about the, the decay products of, of plutonium and the radioisotopes and, and just knew so much about uh, of that because he was involved with so much of it in, in his infancy. Um, so it was really an interesting perspective that he brought to the, yeah. the work. 
Uh, you had been saying before that uh, you came to feel uh, that the model of kind of respectful mm -hmm. listening was the model you wanted to take. Were there some people, any people on this commission that uh, maybe didn't share that approach that you had to deal with? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I won't mention their names because people 50 years from now are going to be looking at this <laughs> interview and it may not be fair uh, to, to mention their names. But there were some people that I felt that uh, were really, uh, their passion for the issue uh, was such that um, I think it really, uh, people were turned off by their presentation and, and just their whole demeanor and, and the way that they acted. And, how did you handle them within the meetings that you had in the cleanup commission? Mm -hmm. I presume you ran the meetings to summit. You, you ran the meetings. Uh, I really helped in terms of the assisting to uh, you know, develop the agendas for the meeting, but that was all in cooperation with the officers for the, oh. the group. But uh, a lot of times they did turn to me because I had the agenda and was familiar with it and you know, really counted on me to, uh, to provide that uh, support. And so I, I will say that it was a challenge because there, uh, because I came into the uh, with kind of an open view of Rocky Flats and had no preconceived notions uh, for things, and so uh, uh, I was kind of caught in the middle then, in the very beginning of my work there, that there was some conflict between those that uh, were very really, uh, kind of the model of, of that I was not used to, that were real activists and were really uh, demeaning of the people at the site and were very distrustful of the people at the site uh, versus those that uh, still may have had that distrust but, distrust but still were respectful. And so I was sort of caught in the middle uh, between them and so uh, without going into a lot of details there was actually an ultimatum made at one time that either I had to go or they were going to go uh, in terms of the people that were, um, because I wasn't out there and I wasn't a screamer and I wasn't uh, doing that and they were really looking for somebody maybe that uh, would side with them on that and um, and so uh, there was the ultimatum either I went or they went and so uh, I managed to keep my employment through the, the time that the group was um, uh, in operation so I guess that answers the story about who went <laughs> for that and so I think it, it was really beneficial for the group that uh, some of these people did leave eventually because it was really uh, causing a split within the organization itself and so uh, I think that if you wanted to look at a, uh, how a group can be effective I mean that you're, it's good to have the diversity of opinion uh, but you still have to you know, have a working relationship and so the group really kind of uh, at one point wasn't working because of the um, problems internally. Yeah. At, at that particular juncture was that difficult for you I mean, did did you feel you had the support of the... Yeah, it was a... Because uh, really a lot of this happened within the first three months of, of my being employed there. And so, uh, I mean, again, this was my first real job in life, and, and I was really disappointed that it wasn't turning out but how I thought, you know, a real job was supposed to operate. You know, I thought everybody got along and, uh, you know, you acted professionally, but uh, uh, I learned that that isn't always the case. And so... Uh, I was happy that uh, most of the problem was solved, though within the, probably within the first year that I had worked at it, it all resolved mm -hmm. itself, and so that was good. Now, um, so you worked with them for about four years, is mm -hmm. that right? That was, uh, let's see, October of 93, then I started working for my current employer, the Citizens Advisory Board, in uh, June of 94. So it wasn't quite four years, but almost. Uh -huh. And at, at the end of the Cleanup Commission's mm -hmm. work, uh, it, it ended with the grant, is that right? Right, we were, they received two-year grant installments, and mm -hmm. so they had their first grant, and we'd actually gone through a, an application or uh, awarded a second grant. And I think the amount for each one was like $50,000. And so it was uh, over two th or you know, 50000 over two years. Uh, you know, it was not a, a huge sum of money, and so it was a good thing that we had good benefactors who provided us with office space uh, that was free and, and provided a lot of in-kind services to us. So, mm -hmm. um, so that was good to help and, us and conserve our money. And those two organizations that you worked uh, with were also nonprofits involved with That's Rocky right. Flats? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that was 
Physicians for, Physicians social? for social responsibility, and so they, uh, you know, among other things, Rocky Flats was one of the issues that they were uh, heavily involved with, and then the other group was the Colorado Coalition for the Prevention of Nuclear War, uh, and so they were the uh, and the, the kind people that allowed us to use their office space were the uh, the Salzmans, and that was Manny Salzman, and I'm sorry I can't remember his wife's name, uh, but uh, Joan, maybe Manny and Joan Salzman. Uh, but they were, uh, uh, he was a, uh, a radiologist, a, a physician, has worked as a radiologist, and uh, they owned a building in Lower Downtown Denver before Lower Downtown Denver was on the map, and uh, so they had this uh, uh, four-story building was on Line Coop Street, and so uh, we were uh, originally on the second floor, then we eventually moved down into the, uh, the basement level, the garden level, as they called it. Uh, for the building, but they provided that space to the coalition and the cleanup commission and the uh, physicians for social responsibility for free. Uh, so it was really a good uh, thing for our three groups because finding an office space, and especially finding an office space in downtown Denver, was uh, was really beneficial to, to have that. But it was in the early days, and so there was no Coors Field yes. at that time, and so there really wasn't a lot uh, happening down there. But uh, today it would be really a valuable space. So. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, did you uh, did you meet often with um, representatives of the plant and uh, DOE? Mm -hmm. We had. Uh, I was trying to remember my first time that I was actually invited to to go to Rocky Flats, and it was uh, one of the first times that a lot of the longtime activists had ever been on a Rocky Flats, and that was within a year of, of my first being employed by the. Cleanup Commission, so that may have been in the spring of, of uh, 1991, uh -huh. and so that was really our first time for citizens to go into the the site, uh -huh. and so that was a very interesting experience. And you were uh, allowed in, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and it was uh, to meet with the manager at the site at that time was Bob Nelson, and uh, so he invited a group of activists to meet in his office, and so it was. Uh, um, I just remember that was. Uh, very momentous occasion for that, yeah. uh, but then there were. Uh, uh, Can you remember the details of that in terms of? Did you have to get badged and go through a lot of procedures? Yeah, I think that uh, we probably first had to meet here in, in this building and you know, building 60, uh, and then there may have been a. Uh, they had more of a badging activity at the actual gate that goes into the site. And so we probably had to stop there as well. And then there was uh, people checking your badges as you went into the main office building where uh, Mr. Nelson's office was located. And so, um, and then as uh, I remember subsequent tours after that when we actually got to go into the production buildings. And that was a real, you know, this was the first time civilians had been allowed or, you know, people that didn't have an association to site to go in those buildings, and so that was really to, you know, that you had to dress up in the special coveralls and, and to do all that and to wear a, a radiation detector on your uh, chest somewhere and uh, to go through the security screenings and uh, they actually at one point had a scanner that you had to put your hand, it was called a five-point scanner or something, and so it, it measured the distance between your the digits on your fingers and uh, you had to uh, apply for this scanning ahead of time uh, to get it done so it would be in the computer then whenever you would visit the site then your scan would be automatically uh, uh, involved and in, or in the, the system and so uh, you know it was pretty amazing as somebody that didn't do that every day for to go to work like all the employees were used to doing that kind of stuff but as a visitor to to go in those buildings for the first time was a, was pretty interesting yeah, yeah. on that and the, the security was a uh, and this was in the, the mid 1990s, probably mm -hmm. when uh, we were taking these types of tours, and the security was real, uh, was very tight. And so you know you had the guards walking through the hallways of the buildings, you know the armed guards, and uh, you would see these little barricades that they had that was like a, a V-shaped piece of uh, metal or armor plating that was uh, you know about maybe five feet tall that uh -huh. had slots cut out of it. And so these were stationed in the in the hallways, and so this was a there was ever somebody that would go into the buildings, you know, that wasn't supposed to be there, and the guards needed to uh, cover themselves with these would be like little barricades that they could go behind, and uh, you know. But it was just interesting to to see these things, uh, you know, as coming in for the first time, and uh, just the the secrecy involved with the, you know, I remember uh, 
maybe I shouldn't be telling this story, but uh, one of the times we were in uh, building 371, which was one of the newer buildings out at Rocky Flats, and uh, we were in a room, and uh, on the wall was a, a chart that was kind of like a, a schematic diagram of the floor plan of the building. And so that was like something that we weren't supposed to see. That was this uh, top secret item. And so they actually had a, a piece of canvas then which was rolled up above that map that they could drop down in case there were ever any other, any uncleared people that would come into that conference room. And so somebody had forgot to, you know, pull the strings and to lower the canvas. And so, I mean, it was just a drawing of the, you know, schematic of the floor plan for the building, but, you know, you weren't supposed to see that because it was a cleared uh, piece of information. And so I always remember that as uh -huh. uh, kind of a paranoia of <laughs> what was going on uh, for the site. So. Uh -huh. Now, when you met with Bob Nelson for the first time, mm -hmm. was you and, and, and the officers or the whole group? Actually, I think it was uh, uh, Leroy Moore was there, who was a, a longtime activist, and uh, Jan Pilcher and myself, and I think there may have been uh, Tom Rao, who was with the American Friends Service Committee, uh, and it may have just been that small group. I don't remember any of the other members of the Cleanup Commission. And I think that, because uh, this was during the day, and so I think that most of the people that I worked with also had daytime jobs and so weren't able to go. So it was just a small group of us that, that went. And what was your impression I mean did you have an impression of him he had invited mm -hmm. you there uh -huh. and I can't remember exactly what the topic of the discussion was but I, I think it must have been with some cleanup proposal or or something that he wanted to talk to us about but uh, you know it was and that was the only purpose but we didn't see or visit anything else other than to be in his office that day but uh, I guess that was pretty momentous that that was, yeah. you know, people were able to go on the site because there had been protesters that, you know, had tried to get onto the site that were arrested and, you know, and had to spend time in jail. And so that was, uh, uh, you know, for people, you know, people that, you know, weren't working at the site to be able to go on was, was pretty momentous. Yeah. Yeah. Now, would this have been before production was officially halted? I mean, the, the FBI raid was mm -hmm. in 1989, and then there was that period of time as I understand it, where uh, no production was going on, but it was kind of this, it was Right, it would have been in during that restart period when they were trying to get the site up and running again yeah. uh, for that. So there wasn't any official activities in terms of weapons production, but there was the effort on to, to restart the uh, plutonium operations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the cleanup commission was operating during that time. That's right. So you didn't really know that production no. had stopped. Do you remember what it was like for you when uh, the decision was made? I guess President Bush announced it and that revealed that the decision was made not to have production here. Is that your recollection? Yeah, that was it with his State of the Union address, and uh, so it was in January of 1992, and so it was a, uh, I forgot the exact uh, warhead that was involved uh, for that, but. Uh, I didn't know when he, because I remember watching that City of the Union address that night, and and I didn't think anything of it. And so, but then I remember the next day coming to work, and uh, and you know people were talking about that. Well, that was the last warhead that was on s slated to be produced at Rocky Flats, and so uh, that was it. I mean, the, the nuclear mission was was over in terms of, of you know having a product that needed to be ordered, you know, and then to to go through the the manufacturing process. And so I think that there was still a thought, well, you know, they need to have a standby capacity, though, for, uh, for producing that. So it took for a, probably a few months then to figure out the exact, that that was indeed the end for Rocky Flats and that they uh, were no longer interested in, in uh, uh, that, this facility at all for, for any kind of even standby capacity mm -hmm. for that. So. Uh -huh. so that must have had an impact on the cleanup commission because when you first started, it wasn't clear, mm -hmm. and then by the time you ended, it was clear. Is right. that correct? I think that uh, it probably took you know within a a, a year for them, uh, but there was a, a party that was held by the activist community that was maybe within a year after that, and uh, and it was like the celebration for you know because they worked so long to to close down Rocky Flats, and so that's what 
so many people had been involved with for so long in the activist community was, uh, was to close down the site. And so you know, looking at the environmental contamination and, and those issues was a reason why you should close down the facility. But uh, a lot of people then left the effort uh, after that. Uh, they had their celebration and it was actually a, a date on the calendar and people assembled and, mm -hmm. and really celebrated the, the fact that the site was being closed uh, and that the mission, the nuclear mission was over. And so a lot of those people then left the, uh, the arena of activism at Rocky Flats. And so it was a uh, kind of a different time then because then you had people that needed to uh, be recruited then that were more interested in the environmental uh, cleanup. And, and, and so that was really a transition then for the, uh, the community because there really was a lot of the longtime activists that you know, did a good job and, and they closed down the site and so their work was over. Uh -huh. And so then bringing people in that then had a, an interest in the environmental aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to, to, to draw a historical timeline, then that's where we are today then in terms of the, with the cleanup mission ending at the site, uh, then it's really looking the people that are going to be interested in, in the long-term stewardship of the facility and to make sure that there's always going to be a, a monitoring program in place for the, any contamination that will be left behind. And, and then people that are interested in its conversion to a wildlife refuge and all that means in terms of uh, you know, protecting the grasslands and the, the fragile ecosystem and, and all the, the issues that will be involved as a wildlife refuge. And so there will be another transition uh, to be made as the, the, the cleanup mission ends. Uh -huh. So now when the, um, the, the cleanup commission's work ended, uh, was that uh, when you began to get involved with the <coughs> Citizens Advisory Board mm -hmm. and, and to also do the national work? Or maybe you can just explain where, where you, your role uh -huh. went then. Well, the, uh, the decision to, because uh, we were lucky here at Rocky Flats that there was a lot of, of citizen involvement uh, already. Uh, but as some of the other uh, federal facilities across the country where there was a, a cleanup or uh, that were on the Superfund list, that there really was an active community involvement in the cleanup decision making or any kind of decision making for those facilities. And so the, uh, there was a group called the Federal Facilities Environmental Restoration Dialogue Committee, which was a federal advisory committee that was established by the Environmental Protection Agency. And this, uh, this group uh, had its meetings in the uh, early 1990s. And they were really looking at how uh, local governments, how state governments, how the citizen activist community uh, could become more involved in the budget decision making process for the cleanup. Because there was always a concern that uh, Congress wasn't going to be providing enough money to clean up these sites. And so they wanted to make sure that there was a way to, for the citizens the, and the governments, the state governments and local governments, uh, that were concerned about the cleanup to make sure that they had a voice in being able to talk about the, the budget uh, and making sure that there was enough money. And so uh, this Federal F Facilities Environmental Restoration Dialogue Committee, or the Keystone Group as it was called because the facilitator com facilitating company that managed them was called the Keystone Group. And so I'll refer to them as the Keystone uh, Group from now on. Uh, but this committee came up with, uh, uh, met for a couple of years and they came up with a recommendation that uh, sure it would be great to look at just the budget aspect, but there was more need for involvement in other than just the, uh, the budget decision making and, and getting money to make sure that the cleanup could happen. But what were the cleanup decisions going to be and how uh, you know, citizens and, could be involved in that uh, process. And so one of their recommendations was that there would be uh, site-specific advisory boards, as they called them, formed at each of these uh, federal facilities that had uh, contamination. So the Department of Energy had sites at Hanford and Savannah River and uh, Fernald in Ohio and uh, Los Alamos and the Nevada test site. You know, it had its facilities involved with the nuclear weapons production. Uh, the Department of Defense had a lot of uh, Army bases, Air Force bases, Naval bases that were uh, in some manner contaminated and needed to be cleaned up. And so uh, it was really any federal facility that you know, needed to be cleaned up and, and how best to involve the local communities in that the citizens in those cleanups. And so uh, uh, this Keystone group then made the recommendation that they form these citizen advisory committees. And so uh, for Rocky Flats, there was already so much citizen involvement that it was a matter of, well, okay, we're going to form another new group 
uh, and what will this mean for us? And so uh, uh, it really meant that the, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency was no longer interested in providing funding for the, the TAG grant for the Cleanup Commission, so that meant that that group would likely have to would go away because the, um, they would rather see the Department of Energy using its funds for the official uh, funding of the group. Uh, there was another group called the Colorado uh, Coalition on Rocky Flats, uh, which was formed by uh, appointment, its members were appointed by the, uh, which was then Congressman David Skaggs and uh, then Governor uh, Romer uh, were the two that appointed the members to this group. And so it was really kind of a blue ribbon committee that was looking at Rocky Flats uh, cleanup and the closure and, and everything. And so that group was in operation. Uh, and then there was really no, uh, uh, the decision was then that they would bid them merge into the Citizens Advisory Board that was formed for Rocky Flats. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we weren't without citizen involvement. And, but in the other sites across the country that there was a need for kind of like starting from scratch to go out and recruit people to be involved in the advisory boards of these different sites. And so for the Department of Energy, uh, uh, they again called their advisory board site specific advisory boards. Uh, the Department of uh, Defense ended up calling theirs restoration advisory boards. And so, uh, but there are, there's this active network of these uh, uh, boards that now are involved in the cleanup of federal facilities uh, across the country. Uh -huh. And so. And you have uh, visited with some of them, is that right? right? Mm -hmm. I've been to most of the, there's actually nine boards that make up, uh, or uh, local boards that make up the national organization we belong to, which is called the Environmental Management Site-Specific Advisory Board. And so uh, uh, the Rocky Flat Citizens Advisory Board was formed in 1993 is when they first started holding their uh, meetings. And I was uh, uh, hired by them uh, in 1994 because uh, they had to get organized and decide what staff that they needed and then have a hiring process. and and everything. So uh, they had all that work done and was able to hire a staff by June of 1994. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, they hired four of us to be their uh, initial employees. Um, the other uh, sites across the country, uh, uh, it took a, a while for them to get organized and so uh, uh, the Rocky Flats Advisory Board uh, decided that they wanted to become a, a non-profit organization as, as their official means to uh, organize. And it was really important uh, for them because they wanted to make sure that they could maintain some independence from the Department of Energy. Uh, and that idea of independence and credibility of the citizens group uh, was important. And so uh, they sought out and were was it able to, uh, uh, to get a 501c3 nonprofit status. Uh -huh. And so that's their, uh, how they were organized. Uh, that's not true of some of the others. That's right. The, uh, and we are also a federal advisory committee to the Department of Energy. And so, uh, uh, these uh, federal advisory, oh. <laughs> so sorry. Okay. Uh, the federal advisory committee uh, is a uh, official process where uh, uh, the federal agencies can seek out advice from whoever they want to uh, in the community, or uh, uh, like the. the uh, so for the Rocky Flats community, I mean it was already a foregone conclusion that we would you know, be able to form this group. But for other sites, like the Hanford site in, in Washington State was already had a pretty activist community as well, so uh, they were ready to form a group. But the uh, Paducah facility, which is a uranium rich enrichment facility in, in Kentucky, uh, they really had no active citizen involvement uh, before that time. And so they really had to go out and recruit uh, people to become members of their advisory committee. And um, so then that's how uh, we are organized nationally as a federal advisory committee. And so then there's nine sites uh, that in different locations across the country that are more involved with the weapons production, nuclear weapons production. Um, so but, uh, we each kind of run independently, but then we do have this national umbrella group that we belong to. Are you asked to, to be like a consultant to some of those other groups? Uh, do you do that informally? The main work that I do on a national basis is then as a, uh, since I am a, a paid staff member for our group and so the, the other boards have uh, different mechanisms for fighting their, their staff support and so I work uh, with them and so we do have national meetings that are held uh, twice a year where the, uh, the, the chairs, the leaders of the different advisory boards get together and hold meetings and so we kind of those, schedule those meetings at different sites across the country and so 
uh, like we've hosted meetings and then the Hanford sites hosted meetings and we'll have one coming up in April of this year that will be at the Savannah River site. So we'll uh, then, the, you know, so we help with the coasting, uh, you know, the, the planning and preparation for those meetings from all of us who are working for the boards mm -hmm. uh, get together mm -hmm. on that. And then if there's any uh, meeting facilitation that needs to be done to actually help to run the meetings, then we, we do that as well. Mm -hmm. So that's my contribution to the, the national is to be part of the, you know, the kind of the staff team for the national yeah. meetings and workshops. Has that given you an overall view of the nuclear weapons complex? It's been really interesting to see the, because uh, uh, it, it's so easy to get involved with your, your, your local site and say, you know, look at all the problems we have at Rocky Flats, but uh, to go and, and look at some of the other facilities across the country, and like I'll use the Hanford facility up in Richland, Washington, which is uh, a much larger facility. I mean, we talk about Rocky Flats as 6,500 acres, and so that's not many square miles, but then when you get up to the, uh, the Hanford facility, but there are hundreds of square miles. I mean, it's just a huge facility uh, that's up there along the Columbia River uh, in the uh, kind of the fruit orchard area. I mean, Washington State's known for its apple production, and so this is where a lot of the orchards are located. Uh, and so it's a, you know, a farming area, and then it has this large reservation where the government uh, established during the Manhattan Project, so it was one of the first facilities where the uh, the first plutonium then was produced that went into the very first uh, atomic bomb that was dropped and I uh, forgot which one, either uh, Nagasaki or Hiroshima, which was the plutonium bomb, but uh, that's where the plutonium originally came from, this uh, facility at, at Hanford. And so uh, there's a lot of, uh, of nuclear reactors, I think there's maybe, uh, there's under 10, but there's quite a few of them that are stationed along the Columbia River. Uh, and so uh, back in the old days when these uh, reactors were operating, uh, there weren't a lot of the environmental laws that we have now. Uh, and then the uh, actual getting the plutonium, separating out the plutonium uh, from the, the fuel rods, which are uh, in the, uh, the, the nuclear reactors, and they put the fuel rods in there, they generate the, the power, the electricity, that's the, the main product that comes out of there, but uh, the plutonium is kind of a byproduct of the nuclear chain reaction. and so. Uh, but then it's a very valuable material for the weapons production, and so they have to take the fuel rods out of the reactors, uh, melt them down, and then do an extraction process to get the plutonium separated from the other materials that are in there. And then the, they purify the plutonium, and, and, it, and they form it into little metal ingots, and then that's what ship, was shipped here to Rocky Flats. Uh, the plutonium uh, separation process is a very uh, dangerous and dirty operation. And so they produce millions and millions and millions of gallons of, of high-level nuclear waste uh, that they pumped into tanks that were below the ground. And so these tanks originally were just single-shell tanks, which then leaked over the years. Uh, and so it's these you know, really dangerous nuclear materials that have leaked out uh, into, these, into the ground surrounding these tanks. And they're just on the banks of the Columbia River, and so then that material is moving down the Columbia River. And so uh, uh, to just look at the environmental problem with that part alone, but then they buried nuclear waste, uh, other materials at that site uh, throughout its history, and so there's just acres and acres and acres of uh, buried nuclear waste that needs to be dealt with, because it wasn't, you know, they just basically dug a hole and threw it in, and with no linings or anything that we would have for modern type of waste facilities, and so they're having to, to go back and correct those problems, and uh, so, Rocky. I'm going to interrupt you now, okay. because our tape is, uh, I need to change the tape okay. <laughs> so we can just remember where, okay. where we are. Okay. Continuation of the oral history with Ken Corkia. And uh, uh, we were talking about the, um, the Hanford site mm -hmm. and, and your, your opportunity to overview all the other sites mm -hmm. in addition to what you've got. So mm -hmm. I'll just pick up there. But I think I was, because uh, I talked about the, the underground tanks that had leaked the material in the, close by the Columbia River. Then there was the large uh, burial yards where they had just buried other kinds of nuclear waste. Um, and so, I mean, this is a large facility, and they uh, you know, have these, then just dealing with the reactors that they have that will need to be, uh, uh, currently their only plan is to mothball them and to keep them uh, protected for up to 
I think in the late like 2080s or something is the goal for eventually being able to to, to remove these reactors from the uh, uh, reactor buildings from the, the landscape. Um, and so, you know, Rocky Flats cleanup will be done this year, which is an incredible accomplishment. But the cleanup of the Hanford site is going to take you know decades into the future. And so, um, you know, we we tend to get focused on our own backyard and say, oh, we've got a lot of problems here at Rocky Flats, but we've been very lucky in terms of the, uh, what could have happened to Rocky Flats compared to what happened at some of the other sites in terms of the, the really big problems in the, uh, for that. And uh, uh, the fact that they'll be able to clean up Rocky Flats and, and to be able to allow it to become a wildlife refuge is a, is a major accomplishment. And uh, I'm confident that they will be able to uh, you know, provide a safe uh, experience for a person that would visit here as a refuge. And so that's a major accomplishment. But uh, to be able to accomplish the same thing as some of the other facilities that the Department of Energy has that were involved in weapons production, uh, is they're not going to be as fortunate on that. So Have you had any feelings like, you know, seeing these other sites and then coming back and seeing how um, concerned and worried so many people are mm -hmm. about Rocky Flats? Does that, uh, has that given you any particular perspective? Well, it's hard to, because uh, each person, I guess, approaches their level of, of what they feel is a risk and what is an acceptable risk and uh, for that. And uh, for me, uh, uh, the, the radioactive materials at Rocky Flats have always been the thing that have galvanized the public and, and generated the most interest. And then plutonium in particular is the, is the really bad actor on that. And so. Uh, you hear people talk about plutonium as being the most dangerous material that's you know ever known to mankind on um, that and, and and so I've always was interested in how that quote got out there or how that information got out there and the pr people that first started talking about that and I don't know who it was but I understand that the generation of that uh, idea first came from the fact that it could be used in a, in a weapon uh, to make this catastrophic explosion which would then you know you know, could do a lot of damage and so that as a as a material ounce for ounce and its ability to do that is really where that statement came from it's the most dangerous material known to mankind but as a nuclear material it really doesn't have any more uh, uh, danger associated with it than what other and they're all bad they're all you don't want to be exposed to radioactive materials and so that's why we have to have protections in place and everything but uh, plutonium doesn't have as an alpha emitting nuclear material uh, an alpha particle is an alpha particle is an alpha particle, and it really doesn't matter where it comes from. Uh, and so if it's in your body, you don't want it to be there, but, um, uh, you know, it's really no different from other nuclear materials. And so um, I think that there's been a lot of, of, of extra fear associated with Rocky Flats that maybe uh, wasn't as, as warranted as, as necessary on that. And I think people have a... These are difficult things for me to talk about because, uh, uh, you know, people want to uh, have their preconceived notions of where uh, the dangers of these materials. But it took me a long time to learn and to appreciate that, uh, you know, uh, plutonium is a dangerous material, but it's no more dangerous than other materials that we have in dealing with the rocky flats. And uh, when you're talking about the, uh, the potential for uh, contamination from uh, volatile organic compounds or some of the metals that were used, other metals that were used at rocky flats, and uh, you know, those are just as dangerous in terms of being able to provide a, a health impact uh, than, than what the plutonium is. And, and so you just need to, to learn to put things in perspective. And I think that's something that I, it took a long time for me to be able to learn and to appreciate. Uh -huh. In working with the citizens on the Citizens Advisory Board, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've, you've been working with them for more than... Uh, About 11 years. 11 years. This is my 12th year, I guess, so... so uh, what has that been like? <laughs> Maybe you can just start early mm -hmm. on. And, and well, I think that uh, if you look at the difference between uh, when I worked with the, the Cleanup Commission, uh, there primarily everybody was on the, the uh, weren't always on the same page, but they were at least in the same chapter of the book. Uh, whereas one of the uh, principles that, that was used in establishing the, the Citizens Advisory Board but that would be a, a very diverse organization that would represent all interests in the community around Rocky Flats. And so uh, 
we've had site workers on there, we've had uh, researchers, we've had you know, people with very technical backgrounds, we've had uh, people who are neighbors of the facility, we've had healthcare professionals. So we have people that come from a lot of different perspectives and a lot of the people have had no previous experience with Rocky Flats. Uh, they're just interested in community service and, and this was a good venue for them to, to provide a service to the community. Uh, so we've had, uh, you know, people that have approached, you know, especially in the, in the very beginning days at the Citizens Advisory Board, uh, where we had people that used to yell at each other at meetings, where a site worker uh, would yell at one of the activists and they would always get into arguments and, you know, sat on the opposite side of the room. Suddenly they were sitting around the same table as members of the same organization on that and so uh, that must have been interesting it was very interesting and the group also decided that it was going to operate by consensus and so you had to then in order to to make a major decision on a recommendation on a cleanup proposal for you know how to do something at Rocky Flats that the group had to agree 100 percent oh. for that and so uh, that's in their bylaws and so they've all, throughout the course of their history they've managed to produce over a hundred consensus recommendations and they're is a provision in their bylaws that allows them to have a uh, to split and have a super majority they call it where if 75 percent of the members would approve something and only 25 percent dissented then that they could uh, still pass a recommendation uh, but it would be allow them the, the minority group then to write a, a position that would be different and then to attach that they have never used that in the entire history of the organization they've always been able to work through and come up with a, a consensus view that's amazing. Now, the, the decision to use consensus, was that uh, arrived at by the group in its original? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, because uh, it was really important for the people that were, uh, uh, that got together, and kind of like the founding nucleus of the, of the board, that even before any official members were selected, of course there was a lot of interest in the community to form the Citizens Advisory Board, so uh, those that came together for those initial discussions, that was one of the, uh, things that they felt was most important was the group's decision making would be by consensus. And so the, uh, that was a, a recommendation that was made to the, uh, the group when it was officially formed. And so with that group in writing its own bylaws and when it was, uh, the board was officially formed, you know, could have chosen differently, but they really uh, chose to, to continue with that wish that was established early on that the group would be uh, working by consensus. And in your opinion, that has been helpful? I think it has because uh, uh, the only uh, argument that I would make against it is there have been issues uh, that have divided the board because of the diversity of membership where the members knew that they weren't going to be able to achieve consensus on it. Uh, but it wasn't uh, that important for them then that they would uh, be coming up with recommendations that weren't by consensus, so they, they just set those issues aside. And, uh, but for all, I think most of the important issues of the day that have come up uh, throughout the, the history of the group, that they have really met the challenge and they have gone out to, um, to work out their differences and to come up with a, um, a consensus viewpoint. And it's really been a challenge sometimes, but uh, other times it's uh, uh, it just amazes me how the members have been able to work together and to, uh, to realize how far they're able to push one another. And uh, I think in bringing in new members, because we've had, uh, you know, over the course of 11 years or 12 years now, we've been able to bring in a lot of new people uh, to the board as membership turns over. And so uh, trying to describe the consensus process, you know, is, is unless you see it in action, it's kind of hard to describe it because you think of it as, uh, you know, you're going to compromise uh, for that, but really what your, uh, uh, those that are true uh, practitioners of consensus say that you're not compromising, that you're trying to reach a, a viewpoint in which everybody's needs are satisfied, and so it's even better than compromise, that you know, you're trying to come up with a, uh, something that you know, everybody can live with and that they know is, a, is in their best interest. So. Now it's said that uh, groups that use consensus have to take much longer, uh, you know, to arrive at that. Mm -hmm. Is has that been? Would you say that that has been your experience or what you've mm -hmm. observed happening or not? We've really learned how to deal with that because if uh, uh, in the group's early history, a lot of the 
uh, recommendations would be developed by a committee. And so we've had different committees, you know, just subgroups of the board on that. And so then uh, the, the main work on the, the uh, consensus building wouldn't happen then until the, the full board meeting. And so when we would meet for our official monthly board meeting when, when official business is taken care of. And so if there has a, wasn't any kind of a, a working of the issue or trying to involve other members that weren't on the committee that developed a, a draft recommendation, uh, if you waited until the board meeting to do that, oftentimes it would be very difficult then to, to get something done in, in a short, concise period of time. And so you may have to carry it over for another month uh, to do that. And so uh, with the advent of uh, better communications technology, meaning the internet and, and email, uh, we've been able to establish a, a, an email system where uh, draft recommendations can go out to the board almost as, as soon as they are developed for kind of initial comments and so members can communicate with one another and make suggestion changes. And so uh, a lot of that work goes on then before we get to a board meeting and so oftentimes the disagreements or the, the need to, to work on finding a common ground has already been established uh, before we meet. And so then uh, uh, once we get to the, the board meetings where the official action takes place on the recommendation, uh, that work has already been done on that. And so you know, having this email system being able to work kind of behind the scenes and to have uh, discussions about things, you know, outside of meetings has really been beneficial. Have there been um, conflicts either overt or covert with um, uh, Rocky Flats management or DOE people? Or, um... uh, conflicts between our board and the, right. the people at the site? Uh, for the most part, we've gone along uh, very well with the uh, Representative, representatives from the Department of Energy as well as the, uh, the uh, members of the regulatory agencies and uh, we have what we call ex officio uh, membership slots on our board and so uh, representatives from the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Health Department and now the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and so they'll be the ones taking over the site in the future uh, sit as ex officio members on our board and that they take part in all the discussions uh, the only thing they can't do is vote at the end when it comes to approving a recommendation or, or any official action of the board. And so I think that's been really beneficial to have them in there because they can talk about their concerns uh, ahead of time with something that you know the board is proposing or uh, you know answer questions because a lot of times it, maybe it's just a lack of information and so if they're able to provide information then it helps to resolve an issue uh, without it having to you know, go on paper as an official recommendation or something that you know we can you know, work on things just by having a discussion. So, for the most part, I think that we have been um, have fairly good relationship. Um, the only thing that we've had a, a problem with maybe is our, is our funding uh, for that. And, and two years ago, we took a fairly substantial cut in our budget, uh, which required eventually losing two of our staff members. So we're um, two people now do the work of four and we had to give up our uh, office space and move out here to Rocky Flats where we are here in Building 60 and, and so these are adjustments we were able to make but uh, uh, you know in terms of uh, an ideal situation we would have liked to have had a fairly stable and level funding uh, throughout our existence but it didn't happen that way and we've been able to adapt and the board's been just as productive and effective um, without those additional resources. So. In terms of making uh, recommendations or even decisions mm -hmm. about actual cleanup procedures, what has been the role of the Citizens Advisory Board uh, itself and maybe in contrast to other groups? Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Well, I think that uh, one of the hallmarks of our board's membership is we've been able to attract a lot of very technically capable persons to be on the board. And so these are people that I would say have as much or maybe even more technical capabilities sometimes than the pe people that are developing the plans uh, at the site. And so we're able to, uh, and I think that then there's a respect then, especially when we have somebody that uh, is at the site who's working on a plan or proposal that you know, so you know, I got to go deal with these citizens. Maybe has never dealt with the this community before, and so uh, you know, maybe have a little bit of skepticism about. Well, you know, what are they doing telling me what my job is? On that, 
this person will come to our meeting and then be blown away by the, the level of questions that are coming and the suggestions and the, and the understanding of the issues by the, the people that we've been able to, uh, to have on our board. And so then that really establishes then a, a, a better understanding from the, the people who represent the site and developing these plans of saying, well, you know, we may not always agree with what the citizens say, but uh, sometimes they have some pretty good suggestions and, you know, we should listen to them and to use their expertise in the, um, you know, because if they would have to pay for, uh, um, you know, some of our members, you know, who are consultants in, in other aspects of their life and, you know, maybe charge $100, $150 an hour and to provide that, the number of hours that they provide pro bono to the, the work of the board, I mean, it's been, you add up all those hours over the years, I mean, there's been, you know, thousands and probably tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand worth of, 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 of time that's been given uh, to the site uh, by the members of the community. So it isn't just, you know, citizens, uh, you know, coming and learning about what's happening. These are citizens that are actually contributing uh, to what's being done at Rocky Flats. And um, so I think that that has been a benefit not only for the community, but also for the department of energy and the people that are in charge out here. Do you think there's been a change over the time that you've seen from the very beginning to now in terms of how um, the people running the site or the regulators view the citizens on the board? Very much so. I think that uh, I was talking earlier about the, you know, the original, you know, you had to have a public meeting because you were required to by law, you know, so they were a very formal, rigid type of affairs where the people at the site would sit up and tables at the front of the room, there would be a microphone and then you'd have to sign in ahead of time and, and uh, you know, if you were going to speak and so then you had three minutes to be able to get up and say what you wanted to say and, and they would tell you thank you and there was really a little give and take between, you know, because they were just there to get the comments and not really to comment back to you. Uh, and so those were a lot of the first meetings that you know, we went to. And I think that there, uh, if you would go to a meeting today where there's uh, just a lot of opportunities for give and take and, and basic conversation and, and uh, you know, where it really isn't that formal uh, type of atmosphere anymore. And I think that that's been the, really the big change is that, uh, you know, they become more comfortable and we become more comfortable with the process that, uh, you know, we can work a lot of it you know, before public comment happens and doing it in informal channels. And um, it's really been kind of fun to, to see that evolution. Now, you still have meetings that are open to the public, uh, do you not? That's where, right. Where, and what is that like? People can just come in and say what they think. Right, we have, because uh, we, we have monthly board meetings uh, for our group. And since we're a federal advisory committee, uh, that we're required to have an official public comment period where uh, people who aren't on the board can and bring up whatever issues or, or matters that they want. And so, uh, you know, we have to schedule that into our agenda where it's the f a formal public comment period, and so it's on the agenda. But we try to generally allow the uh, uh, people who attend our meetings or just sit in the audience, uh, if they have questions or comments that they want to raise during the other parts of the meetings and uh, during presentations by site officials or, or whatever, you know, to provide them with some opportunity to, to be able to, to interact with our meetings uh, as well. And so and we don't get a large turnout always at our meetings, so it's been probably it's a good thing that we don't because then that way the, the people that really attend on a regular basis can uh, participate more actively than if we had a, a large turnout for every meeting. And, and that end. But if there's something that's really of interest to the community, then we notice that there's a large uptick in terms of the interest and the attendance at our meetings and so we can tell if there's something that's been in the paper and people are, are reading about it and want to find more about it and so uh, you know that they'll come and seek us out and so that always helps us to know that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and uh, that we're there for the community to come. What have been some of the issues over the, the period of time, mm -hmm. you know, over your long history that have been most uh, uh, interesting or contentious? Probably the one that sticks in my mind as being the most contentious and, uh, is the idea of controlled burning at the site for weed control. And so uh, as a uh, large 6,500 acre piece of ground, I mean, and you know, for 
the central area of the site was about 350 acres where there actually the, the industrial work took place. And then the rest of the, the site is, is pretty much open space and has been for the last 50 years. Um, and so there's a, a need for uh, uh, weed control because the site needs to do something because for its neighbors outside the boundaries, you know, aren't going to be too happy if they're growing knapweed out here and it's going to become a reservoir for, for knapweed and so they do need to come up with weed control. And so one of the, the means that's used on other properties, you know, beyond the boundaries of Rocky Flats is control burning. Uh, um, people don't like to use the word control, but it's, uh, you know, prescribed burning or, or however you want to, to describe it, the activity. But uh, there have been uh, several lightning strike fires that have occurred, or quite a few of them at the time that I've been involved with Rocky Flats. And so uh, people say that if you don't do something to control the the, the weeds or the grasses or something that eventually the, the, the site will burn just from, from natural causes. And, um, but then, uh, so then it's very interesting because there's the people who are interested in the ecology side of things are very supportive of the, of the controlled burn, but then people are, are, you know, concerned about the potential for contamination, you know, to be stirred up uh, during that. And so it's been a really interesting uh, uh, arguments and people that you would be surprised would be on the different sides of the argument would come out and you know to, to do that and so uh, um, I think that's been one of the the more interesting and contentious issues that's been brought up and they've only had one uh, really scheduled controlled burn at Rocky Flats where they it was a where they had a hearing beforehand to explain what they were going to do and had a lot of study of what was going to happen during the burn and so then they had you know instruments and everything that were involved on that, but they haven't had it since that time. That was probably in 1990, maybe 2000, 2001, when that occurred. So it's been a while since they proposed that. Now, I think there's been other groups that are, are working on cleanup and advising. There's this group called Rift Clog, mm -hmm. uh, and then I think there's another group. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to how they are different from the Mm -hmm. There was a, uh, because of the concern about the economic impacts of the closure of, of sites like Rocky Flats and other sites that were involved in nuclear weapons production, uh, there was a, uh, a separate funding and, and citizen, or it wasn't just for citizens, but they were called community reuse organizations where, where site-specific advisory boards and looking mainly at the cleanup. Uh, the Department of Energy and Congress established what they call community reuse organizations that would look at the economic impacts of the downsizing and closure of, of these sites like Rocky Flats. And so uh, when that funding program and that uh, uh, group, the first one at Rocky Flats was called the Rocky Flats Local Impacts Initiative. And so uh, they were really uh, a broad coalition of, of like members from chambers of commerce and local governments and uh, economic development councils and then they did have members from the activist community uh, were involved and actually I was uh, as a representative of the cleanup commission and being in the environmental category uh, that I was the representative for the cleanup commission and the environmental group on the local impacts initiative and, and so that was a kind of a and that group formed before the citizens advisory board and so that was really our first taste of, of people that uh, historically did sit around the common table talking about issues got together and so uh, uh, the local impacts initiative was uh, I think they were involved until maybe 95 or 96 and they uh, came to the conclusion that based on the uh, large uh, metropolitan area in which we live and the ability to um, uh, absorb and create new jobs uh, that the economic impacts of the site closure wouldn't be as great as they would be at, say, a, a smaller community where that the Department of Energy site would be like the company town and that was the only employer in town and uh, where that would have a major impact on that. And so the Local Impacts Initiative uh, uh, wrote a final report and they went out of business. And then the, uh, the local governments that were involved in that group decided that they still wanted to, to have some kind of official role and a means to, uh, to have a, a recognized organization. And so then they uh, applied for the, to, to be a, a second community reuse organization, I guess, or a continuing group on that. And so uh, whereas the, the initial group, the Local Impacts Initiative, had broad membership, 
the, the coalition of local governments has just been limited solely to the uh, seven local governments. There's the three counties, Broomfield, uh, Boulder, and Jefferson, and then uh, the cities of Arvada, Westminster, Broom, or Arvada, Westminster, and uh, uh, who am I forgetting? Mm -hmm. The uh, town of Superior is involved as well. So, so they're all sort of members of local government, paid right. staff. Well, let's see, uh, I think most of the official representatives on the group are their, uh, the elected officials, so like a city council person or a county commissioner uh, involved on that. And so they are... Uh, so each, each um, um, local government group appoints their own. Right. right. Okay. And so they have, uh, so there's the seven local governments and, and so a lot of what they do is, is very similar to what the uh, our board does look at cleanup uh, proposals and then they do have uh, uh, because of their grant is under a community reuse organization that there are certain responsibilities that they would have to look at uh, worker issues and worker health benefits and and those type of things but uh, so it's uh, have they in, in your opinion have they had um, different impacts or lesser or greater impact than the citizens, the, the, the group that's really representative of the citizens? Do you have any? Well, it's, it's hard to, uh, I think that their impact is, a lot of their recommendations are very similar to what we have recommended on different activities. And so uh, uh, I think that it would be, uh, it's hard to say that they've had any more impact or we've had any more impact, but I think that we've you know, kind of approached the same issues and have come up with pretty much the same conclusions on a lot of things. So, A lot of the, the differences is that uh, I call them kind of, they're the daytime group and we're the evening group, and so uh, uh, we get a little jealous because of, and mainly because of the official representation, you know, that there are local governments, and so uh, they do have a greater participation or attendance at their meetings of, of people from congressional offices uh, and from the, the um, officials here at Rocky Flats and it's because it's during the working hours and so you know people would rather you know if they're going to go to a meeting it would be during the working hours but when you have to come to an evening meeting and it's outside of the, your, your, the, the day and um, stuff and so we have a harder time attracting people uh, from the congressional representatives and Side officials to our meetings is what uh, the daytime group does. So I'm a little jealous that they yeah. were able to, to do that. But and have there are there other groups that are involved in uh, making cleanup, um, giving advice and consultation? Uh, in the earlier days, there were more recognized groups that would uh, uh, provide. There was the. Uh, can you remember all the names, but the, uh, and the Sierra Club has, has had a, a pretty active role uh, during the years, and, uh, uh, but they're not as much in the current times as what they were involved in the early history of Rocky Flats. Uh, there's been a lot of smaller uh, kind of like uh, sole citizen groups that maybe a, one person would uh, give themselves a name that, to make themselves a little bit more official and so there was a, a lot of that going on in the early days of Rocky Flats and so a lot of those individuals were have gone by the wayside and I think a lot of them are more involved with the, uh, the, the nuclear weapons uh, production activities and so those were kind of the activists that uh, once their mission was completed in terms of stopping the weapons production uh, they left so but there really hasn't been a Today, I'm just uh, between our two groups, are really the, the official ones uh, that are out there. Um, do you, as you look back uh, on the work of the Citizens Advisory Board and maybe even the Cleanup Commission, uh, what, well, taking them separately, let's start with the Cleanup Commission. What, what do you think was that group's uh, biggest contribution, and maybe also what? I think that probably uh, because of the evolution of citizen involvement, you know, when when first it was just you know you went to a formal hearings and you presented your testimony, I think that uh, based on the level of comfort and the, the maybe the surprise and the sights 
part of the level of competence and technical capabilities of, of um, people that were on the cleanup commission. Uh, that then there were opportunities to that were the, those members were invited to uh, sit down in more kind of like working groups uh, to look at specific cleanup projects, uh, kind of a, an advance of the document coming out uh, for formal public comment. And I think that that was really maybe the uh, if I was to pinpoint one area where uh, that was a major accomplishment was was that because that was really the genesis of where we have. Uh, see public involvement today where there's it's a lot more informal and uh, so many more opportunities sort of outside of the, uh, the standard hearing process on um, that. I think it was maybe because they saw the competence and the technical capabilities of the people that were involved with the Cleanup Commission early on. And uh, that has continued then today with the Citizens Advisory Board in, in, in terms of the, uh, being able to, uh, you know, where I think that they respect what we have to say. Uh, they may not always agree with what we have to say, and you know, scientists can argue about anything and everything, and so a lot of that goes on. But I think that they generally, um, when we do provide recommendations and we get a formal response back that says, you know, what were there, what was accepted, you know, what may be adopted from our advice, and, and what wasn't, and why it wasn't, and so they've been really good about providing that feedback to us. The, I, I would imagine that the Citizens Advisory Board over all these years has had to deal with a lot of the things that were done historically for Rocky Flats. Um, at least things that have come out in the news and mm -hmm. so forth. Just asking you personally, have there been things that you have learned or that have, you know, have come out that were big surprises to you? Well, I, uh, probably the thing that comes to mind now, because it's been the most recent in the, in the press, is the, the grand jury report at Rocky Flats. And that's been something that's been going on throughout my entire involvement with Rocky Flats, because I remember when the uh, grand jury was first meeting, uh, and when the uh, report was released, or uh, clandestinely released, I mean, it wasn't supposed to have gone out. and. You know, there was the fine uh, where Rockwell had to pay their $18 million and, uh, for that. And so uh, I remember when all that was going on, and, and so it was, uh, uh, you know, when they talked about uh, illegal burning that was going on, and so that was something as, are they, are they doing that today? You know, that's the questions that I could ask back in the early 90s, and, uh, you know, or is that still going on? And so then we advanced to where we are in the, in the year 2005, uh, where a lot of the issues that are being raised by the, uh, the people that were involved with the grand jury and, and everything from, from you know, 10 years ago, that there's been a lot of, of accomplishment at the site. And so that's where uh, I'm a little bit frustrated for someone that has been involved through this whole history of that is for people to be talking about uh, problems that existed back in, in 1995, and indeed there were problems for that, but they've been addressed in the 10 years that have happened. But then the newspapers pick up the stories and, and talk about, you know, the, um, you know, the grand juror report, you know, said this and that there was this illegal dumping and illegal burning and, and everything. And, and the consequences of those activities have been dealt with. Um, and so we know of that, but then to, you know, it's very easy for Rocky Flats to get in the headlines of the paper on that. And so uh, I think it's been unfair to the site and the work that's gone on. Uh, the, a lot of the, uh, the, they're still able to raise lingering doubts about what has happened because I've been here, I've been a witness to what's happened in the cleanup for the last 10 years and so uh, I think that's unfortunate. Looking back at um, your involvement, um, are, are there things that we haven't covered that, or interesting issues that have come up? Well, uh, maybe the, the legacy of Rocky Flats, and uh, just as a, a funny story about um, one of my disappointments was that uh, I thought that there should be some kind of a lasting symbol at Rocky Flats that people, you know, years from now can look out over the horizon and see. And so 
uh, there was this large water tower that was out here that stood, you know, several hundred feet up in the air, a couple hundred maybe, I don't know how tall it was, but it was a part of the landscape. And so when you were on the eastern plains and looked out towards the mountains here in, in the west that you could see the take out rocky flats along the, the mountain backdrop because of the, the, the uh, water tower that was there. And so um, I was really disappointed when they decided that they were going to tear down the water tower and then down it went. It was, they use explosives and there's a little videotape that shows it crashing over to the side and kind of bouncing as it hits the dirt. And uh, so I think that we always need to remember that Rocky Flats was here and that this isn't 100% cleanup at the site and so that there is an area at the site that will have to be protected uh, uh, for the future. And as we're talking with a, a plutonium which has a half-life of of 24,000 years that, you know, uh, it will be for a long time that there will be some residual plutonium contamination that will be left behind. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, we're able to provide the protection now that people can come out. But we need to continue providing that level of protection far, far, far into the future. And so uh, that's going to be the challenge. And so if somebody is watching this in a time capsule, you know, 200 years from now, how are you doing? You know, uh, are you still remembering that Rocky Flats was out there? And so uh, that's why I thought that there would be uh, that there needs to be some kind of a symbol, uh, and whether they can do something like that in the future, that you know, a monument or something that can go up to to remind people of, of this site and that there you know it has some specialness attached to it, and you know, special may not be a positive uh, connotation that you know that we need to really watch at this site for the long into the future. And so I was sorry to see the, the water tower go because I thought it was a good candidate for kind of being a visual a reminder of what happened out here at Rocky Flats, but perhaps they'll be able to come up with something else. Do you know how that decision was made and why was it taken down? Do you have any idea? I think the, uh, they've all been pretty lame excuses <laughs> in my estimation, but uh, there was the maintenance that you know, somebody would have to paint it every few years and they would check for rust. and. Uh, you know, because they didn't want it to deteriorate, because it, you know, it's a pretty heavy ball that was on, you know, the the water tank itself. You know, it's a pretty heavy thing, and so they have to make sure that the supports are always going to be maintained uh, for that. But um, I don't think it would have been that much to to maintain it. My personal view, I have no idea, you know, what the cost of something like that would be. But um. what has it been like for you in terms of your overall life to spend? So much of it involved with mm -hmm. rocky flats, and you know what kind of impact does that have mm -hmm. on you? Well, I think the because uh, one of the the things uh, I haven't said yet about growing up in Canyon City is that I grew up two miles from another super fun site, uh, the Cotter Uranium Mill, and so it's also a, a site that is involved with uh, uranium uh, radioactive materials uh, releases into the environment, and so. Um, during the time that I was a child growing up and that the, the cotter mill was an active operation and doing a lot of things that it eventually got in trouble for um, and placed it on Superfund. And so, uh, you know, my parents still live in the same house that I grew up with and or grew up in. And, and so that's been a, a, an issue that, uh, you know, had I been a resident or still a resident of Canyon City that I'd probably be uh, actively involved in on that. And so then, uh, uh, Looking at Rocky Flats, then has, has sort of been the, you know, I find it interesting that I would, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, growing up with the with that exposure or potential exposure and problems associated with that super fun site that I would eventually then begin working in, uh, have so much experience with one up here in Denver. That's interesting. Uh, so now, did you growing up uh, think about that or observe what was going on or worry about it? It was uh, the only thing that we ever knew about the site because actually my dad at, at different times uh, he was involved in other construction projects out there and so you know worked out there for a, a period of time and uh, one of the neighbors on our street was a, a chemist that worked out there and so we knew people that you know it was a fairly large employer for a, a, a town the size of Canyon City um, and so the only thing that we ever knew and I remember uh, growing up was that uh, at one time they were working with something that uh, released hydrogen sulfide or rotten egg gas and so uh, there was this one summer in particular that that gas was in the air all the time. And so, uh, you know, 
you get a lot of company during the summer, people coming to visit. And so I just remember my mom always have to act embarrassed because, you know, suddenly this air would be wafting through, you know, and it'd be that, you know, and you'd say, oh, it's that cotter plant again and on that. And so that was the only thing that was, uh, that I really remember growing up that there was any kind of, that you, that you knew that the plant was there. And uh, we lived close enough to, uh, that there was a, uh, Kind of on the very outskirts in, in the country, and so there were all these hills and uh, so that we would used to go climbing and hiking on. And so as you went off, uh, you know, into that south from our house, uh, you know, you could see cotter off in the background. And so they had their large uh, retainment ponds uh, where they would dump their their nuclear materials. And so uh, I was always told as a child growing up that you never, you know, like hike and climb wherever you wanted to, but don't go over there. That that was something that you needed to stay away from. And, and so um, being a dutiful son and always did what my parents told me to do, I did that, I stayed away. Uh, but one of the other neighbors on the street uh, didn't and she was went climbing in there and, and she actually fell into those uh, ponds. And so that was a pretty big thing that, you know, that uh, when they found out that, you know, she was there because they actually saw the people at the, at the plant, you know, and so then they had to call her parents and everything. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if she's had any health effects uh, from that, but, you know, that was something that, um, you know, was, I just remember then there was a big um, stink raised about yes, that, yeah. that she had fallen into, or actually had access and was able to get into their, um, their tailings pond from there. But. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> we'll be done soon. Um, that does remind me, uh, has the Citizen Advisory Board had much involvement with um, worker issues, worker health mm -hmm. issues? That's one of the things that, uh, because we're chartered as an Environmental Management Advisory Board, that the Department of Energy has really limited our uh, scope of work to be uh, issues related to cleanup mm -hmm. uh, for that. And so, not that our members aren't interested in, and we've had workers on our board at different times. Uh, you know, that uh, have tried to raise issues, but uh, generally we've, we've stayed away from the, the worker issues. So that hasn't been that your way. mandate. You right. really have. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we, we do keep up on the, you know, what, what's happening and, and just being a, a resource for the community because we'll get calls, you know, from people at different times that, you know, have questions about it. And so I, you know, need to keep up on the, the latest legislation or, you know, whether the Department of Labor uh, uh, opportunities or resources that are available so that I can refer people uh, to those because that's part of our service to the community as well as to be able to you know, be an independent voice or a resource about Rocky Flats issues and that's something that I uh, enjoy doing and we get a lot of, uh, haven't talked about that aspect, but uh, uh, you know for students that have projects and so we, uh, I've, I've spoken at schools over different times and or at different times, and you know, we have students coming in and doing research papers on Rocky Flats, and, and so it's always interesting to, uh, to interest the next generation in, in about Rocky Flats because that fits in with the legacy yeah. uh, aspect of it, that we want to make sure that there's people that will always know about the site for as long as necessary. Yeah. Apart from the water tower, uh, which is no more, mm -hmm. do you, have you had any thoughts or fantasies about how, you know, what could be done to keep mm -hmm. the the, uh, the site in the public mind? Well, I think that because uh, uh, as a wildlife refuge, they'll definitely need uh, some sort of a contact center, they call it, or uh, I think it, calling it a visitor center is, is pretty appropriate, uh, you know, so people that visit the refuge can and come out and, and get information about, you know, the refuge. Uh, but at the meantime, or at the same time, you want people to know about the legacy or the history of, the, of Rocky Flats. and so. Uh, having the Rocky Flats Museum co-located with the visitor center with the for the refuge purpose it would be really beneficial so that you get you know people are going to come out because they're interested in the you know the ecosystem or, or the refuge or looking at the wildlife but then they need to and remember the the legacy of Rocky Flats and so if there was a museum involved with that that they could you know visit uh, and then having a, a reading room because Rocky Flats all the documents that were involved in its cleanup need to be stored in you know, for perpetuity so researchers can do work and so having that reading room also located in the facility with the museum and the visitor center and then just having a community meeting room, you know, that would be where people could come out and so there could be lectures or uh, meetings and, you know, there will be, you know, a, 
a citizen group involved in the future where they could hold their meetings. Uh, you know, so whether it would be in this building where we're sitting right now here in Building 60, which I think would be an ideal location for such a facility, but um, having it close and at Rocky Flats, I think, is really important to be able to uh, to maintain a presence and to always remember what's happening out here. Because as we talk, it took a, a act of Congress to create the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, and so that's a pretty stringent. You know, it would take another act of Congress to to eliminate the wildlife refuge, but again, that's only an act of Congress, and you know, things could change in the future, and uh, there could be a big pressure for development, you know, that they want to use this land because it has good site views off into the valleys and, the, and everything that's just a big, good area for housing, and so we don't want that to happen in the future out here at this uh, property, and um, you know, so I think that, uh, uh, you know, whatever we can do to make sure that nothing ever happens out here again besides the wildlife refuge is, is a worthy goal and something that we really need to keep up long, long, long to the future. Uh, even though you've been involved really since the production of nuclear weapons, the, the production of the pits that was done here at the site, um, do you or did you have any particular thoughts or feelings about the production of nuclear weapons or has that changed? Or that is a, uh, because I can, when I hear somebody argue that's from the World War II era and talks about the, uh, uh, the, the landing into Japan and whether the invasion into Japan and, and the, the loss of life that would have occurred had we not had the, 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 the initial atomic bombs uh, for that. And so that kind of trade off, I, you know, it's hard for me to, I mean, a lot of Japanese lost their lives on that. but. You know, but you're hearing people talking about the loss of American lives that would have been involved in. And so I, I can't condemn the initial decision to make the weapons and to use them. But I think once we saw the destruction that happened and the impact that it had on the world uh, after their initial use, then to continue with their development and to go through the whole Cold War, I just think is a, uh, I don't know if it was inevitable because mankind has just got to always compete and, and do those kind of things, but I think that the whole development uh, of what happened, and I think if we would add up all the the people that probably have died then as a result of their exposure in some manner to what happened with the creation of, of weapons here in the United States as well as in, in the former Soviet Union where the, the standards were a lot less, and I think that they cut a lot more corners than what they did. And so uh, I don't think that the trade-off and the, the paranoia then for you know, they got one, we got to have one, they got ten, we got to have a hundred. That kind of mentality was really in the best interest of, of, of mankind. And so I really feel regret that that happened on that because I think that, uh, sure, people argue, well, look how successful we were. There, there wasn't ever a use of these weapons. And I say, yet, on that because as long as we have these materials and, uh, you know, you can't put the genie back into the bottle on that. And so, you know, it only takes a very small weapon uh, in a suitcase now to, to you know have a major impact um, and so we've opened that Pandora's box and we'll never be able to close it again so it's really unfortunate that we've reached there but I just really regret the decision that people made to, to, to continue on the development of the weapon because I think it was really um, it was just unfortunate for those that have been exposed to workers uh, to create them and, and the people who live around the site so has that feeling of yours, um, has it been difficult for you to um, you know, have close relationships with the people who feel, have felt so strongly that nuclear weapons are very important, and, or has that? Probably because I don't allow it to be a, an issue that would, would come between myself and, and someone else and, and for workers, and I respect that the work that the people did on that and uh, you know I think that uh, for one it was a very lucrative profession to be involved in. I mean people were paid a, a pretty good premium to work out here at Rocky Flats and so I can understand the, uh, the reason and, and you talk to some employees that were hired you know right out of high school and you know they've had a 30-year career out there and you know those opportunities in any industry are, are few and far between in, in, in modern times 
you know, but uh, people really had a, a good job when they came out here to work at Rocky Flats, and I think that uh, for the most part it was, uh, uh, you know, they had good employers to work for, uh, and so that they were rewarded and, and taken care of uh, financially. But then as we, we now know that maybe the, the, the standards for their protection and the, the need to produce weapons, maybe there were some corners cut and everything that allowed workers to be exposed more than what they, they should have been on that. And so, you know, those stories I probably will re remain to be told on that because the uh, latency period for a person's exposure then from when they were exposed to when they will eventually uh, uh, get cancer and to potentially die from their cancer exposure. Um, you know, and it's hard to, to label whether it was, it was a result of some exposure here at Rocky Flats or, you know, because cancer is so prevalent in our society. but. You know, I think that that's something that the workers, you know, it was good paying jobs, but at what price also did they have to pay for that? So, Is there anything that we haven't covered yet? Uh, we've got a few more minutes. <laughs> well, let's see. Any question? Oh, we, we haven't said now, your, your job with the uh, Citizen Advisory Board lasts how long, or do you know? Uh, probably I. It will I'll last at least through the end of this year in 2005, but uh, beyond that I have um, my doubts about whether there, there will be a, because um, there will be a new organization that was formed called a local stakeholder organization, but uh, I think that their staffing needs will be very minimal compared to what uh, was necessary for, uh, for the active cleanup involved with the Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, so I don't think that there will be those opportunities. So. Um, I, you know, there are other environmental issues that actually I uh, uh, have a lot of passion for in looking at uh, wilderness preservation. Uh, I mean, it's, you can't live in Colorado and not appreciate the, what we have and, and, and to have seen the changes that I have over, you know, I'm now 47 years old and to look at the development of uh, the Front Range and to realize that, uh, you know, what do we want to preserve in Colorado. So being able to work on those type of issues is is really appealing for me to, so if I can find. Are you an outdoor person? Uh, I'm not a skier, so I don't enjoy the, the winter aspect as much as, as what I do in summer, but it's going and hiking and um, never was really a big camper either on that, so it's mainly just day type of, of visits into the, but I do have my favorite spots to go and take pictures and. Um. So it's kind of up in the air for you whether you would remain involved in Rocky Flats or right. move on. Because it would be, uh, you know, I, I'm always going to have an interest in the site because it, you know, it's been a big part of my life <laughs> involved in the in the cleanup, and so I've been really fortunate. I say that, you know, to be able to spend 15 years doing what I have, uh, you know, and working for citizens that are, you know, I don't know that I would give as much time and my energy, you know, as what the volunteers that I work with uh, do for that. And so I've been really impressed, and so it's been a model that, you know, I can look at and say that. You know, if I was able to get that committed and that passionate about an issue, you know, is, is a, a really wonderful, positive thing on that. And so, anything else you can think of? Or? Well, let's see. Look around the room, see if there's any prompts, any pictures that are. We haven't talked about the um, the soil issue. Um, mm -hmm. Was that a, a big one? It, sort of, it got a lot of press for a while. The, in terms of the soil cleanup, so, so clean up. yeah, that was uh, from 1995 up until 10 years basically. <laughs> that was a really big issue uh, for that, and so uh, I think that's really one of the triumphs of, of citizen involvement. Probably the biggest one that I could point to in, in terms of uh, when the, the Department of Energy and the regulators first developed the, their initial soil cleanup level. It was a, a number of 651 pico curies per gram, and so um, that number just didn't set well with the community because we heard of other, there aren't that many places that are contaminated with plutonium uh, in the first place, and so looking at, at other ones across, the, through the entire globe, uh, that, you know, some of the test sites where they tested nuclear weapons, you know, that the, the cleanup level was substantially lower than what it was going to be here at Rocky Flats, and these are out in, in islands that are basically uninhabited. And uh, so why would they have a, a more stringent cleanup than what we would have here at Rocky Flats? And um, so we, uh, 
the community was basically in an uproar about that, and so then we were able to, uh, as a group, uh, get the uh, Department of Energy to provide additional funding then to form an uh, uh, independent citizen group, which then hired its own independent contractor, which then looked at the whole issue of, all, of how you set a cleanup standard and what would be the appropriate number uh, to use here for Rocky Flats. And the, uh, the end result of that uh, work was uh, finished in about 1999 or 1998, and the contractors recommended a number of 35 picocuries per gram, so that's an order to the magnitude less than what uh, was going to be the official uh, number of 651. And so uh, uh, the Department of Energy and the regulators weren't quite willing to accept that number on its face, and so wanted to do more work on their own to, uh, to look at what be an appropriate number. And so then they had a process in which they uh, had uh, a kind of a community working group that was invited to come and look at, at some of the new issues that they were looking at. And, and so we got to learn a lot about the science involved in, in setting cleanup levels and, and learning how you determine the risk and, and all the different exposure pathways and all the considerations that go into determining what would be a safe level of cleanup. So anybody that went through that process, I think, really gained a, an appreciation for, uh, you know, the science and the people that were making those decisions. And uh, so then the end result was that we now know that the cleanup level for the, at least the surface soil at, at the site is 50 picocuries per gram. So the difference between 35, which was recommended by the independent contractor, to the 50 that is the official number that's being used to, to do the cleanup is, is really minimal. There's really no difference between the two. Uh, part of the trade-off, though, was that um, and this was something that the Citizens Advisory Board uh, did not agree 100% uh, as members on that, and so we were uh, just raised concerns about the, uh, the subsurface below three feet. They would allow uh, quite a bit more contamination to be left in the ground, uh, but they really didn't know how much of that contamination might be out there on that, and so uh, it was called the trade-off, and so we're going to do more cleanup on the surface of the 50 picocuries per gram number, but we're going to allow more in the subsurface uh, where the potential for a person to be exposed to that material would be uh, less. And so then, uh, but then you have arguments about, well, what happens 100 years from now, 100, 200 years from now, when somebody could go out and dig into those areas. And so, you know, those arguments still persist. Uh, but I think one of the benefits, or not benefits, but one of the good news stories about Rocky Flats is when they went out to look at those areas where they potentially knew that there were going to be higher levels of contamination, they didn't find it. So all the pipes that were at underground that carried material from building to building uh, that had the, you know, these were kind of higher level plutonium uh, liquid forms that were going through these pipes uh, that could have leaked, and in some places they did leak, but the amount of contamination that they found associated with those pipes has been a lot less than what, so uh, did we make a good bargain when we agreed to go with a more surface cleanup than I would say that we did? on that and so there are uh, you know areas around building foundations uh, that are far below the below six feet below the ground but there will be uh, greater levels of contamination above the 50 picocuries per gram but nothing close to the uh, which would be like uh, 7,000 picocuries per gram was the level that they were willing to allow uh, to be in there and there's nothing that's even approaching that level uh, into the ground so and would you say looking back at that was it Basically, the Citizens Advisory Board that was the, let me say, the power group that pushed that. We were uh, uh, pretty much involved, as the, the local governments were also pretty strongly involved in that. And so they had uh, probably them with their greater political context, uh, were able to, to leverage that side as where uh, we had more of a, the official position with the Department of Energy. And so I think it was. Uh, you know, their lobbying with the elected officials and our uh, recommendations with the Department of Energy that was really wor wor worked in tandem uh, to help see that we were able to get that And that, that soil, uh, the, the group that worked on the mm -hmm. soil level, was, did that emerge out of the C Citizens Advisory Board or was it independent? Then it was uh, uh, actually, uh, it was independent they, uh, to pay for the study, and it was a half million dollars that the Department of Energy provided for it. And since the Citizens Advisory Board already had a grant with the Department of Energy, it was an easy way to just pass the money through our grant. But then the group that was formed that was called the Radionuclide Soil Action Level Oversight Panel uh, had some members from our board, but then had other members of the community that were involved. 
and, it, and so it operated independent from our board and we basically paid the bills uh, for the contractor and then the, any of the administrative support services that they required uh, for their operation. But uh, um, it really worked out. Uh, it was an amazing process because it really allowed, uh, it first it answered the need that there was the concern in the community and so providing that uh, independent voice to come in and, and to, for the, to allow the citizens to have total control over the, the independent study was a, a, just a very positive thing and a very added to the credibility of the whole situation. But then to go through and to learn about the science involved in it. So anybody that really was attended all the meetings and, and sat through and read all the reports you know, really learned a lot about how soil cleanup is done. And, and so uh, you know, and I was one of those persons who sat through a lot of those meetings and so when I uh, look at a number of 50 pico curies per gram and I, I really am confident that if that level is achieved at Rocky Flats that a person that would visit the site as a, as a casual visitor you know, is going to be protected uh, for that and so uh, you know, I, I feel very strongly about that and so uh, you know, and that's because we were able to, to have this you know, intimate view of what, how that was developed and it was developed in a very open manner and so it was uh, Good success story. Looks like we're done. So maybe I'll just uh, okay. thank you and thank you very much. Well, thank you.